All right. Um, let's call the uh, Lee County Charter Review Commission meeting of Tuesday, May 9th, 2023, to order. Looks like we have a quorum. Two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven. I guess we do have a quorum. Um, let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. Andrew, if you would, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. And welcome, guests. It's good to see people here. Um, we're going to start with public comment tonight. So anybody have any public comment they want to make? Yes, anybody? Anybody on the board? Public comment? Okay, nice and quiet crowd. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we do have a uh, scheduled speaker tonight. Matt Caldwell, who is our Lee County appraiser. Matt, if you'd like to uh, walk on up and all right, Chairman. All right, I will take take it away. Thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, extending uh, the invite. And uh, my intention is to give you some top line thoughts. Uh, and then make myself available for y'all to ask questions from either what I bring up or things that I may not bring up uh, initially. But if I have something I can provide for you, some feedback, I'm glad uh, to do it. Uh, so let's uh, lay a few groundwork items. Uh, uh, first of all, this was uh, one of the very first groups I ever served with politically. Uh, Ms. Frazier remembers. Uh, I was appointed to Charter Review in 2006 uh, through 8, and we uh, worked very, very diligently on a lot of the topics, topics that I'm sure this group will talk about again uh, this cycle. As I recall at that time, uh, where we ended up, uh, and don't quote me exactly, I'm sure the minutes exist, but I think we ended up at somewhere around 13 to 15 agreed that the status quo of the structure of our local government uh, was unsatisfactory, but we could never get... Uh, to the 12, at uh, that time was our, our metric, uh, the 12 to agree to what we should replace it with. Uh, and since that time, Lee County has only grown, and I think the pertinent issues have only become uh, more pertinent, as it were. Uh, the other preface, uh, for us to have this conversation, there has to be no sacred cows, none at all. Uh, nothing I'm going to talk about tonight is an indictment of any personality in our local government. In fact, I will say that the current uh, political arrangement in Lee County is the best in my lifetime. In 40 years, I've never seen such a high quality collegiality and competence amongst the board, the executive branch, and the constitutional officers. Uh, but when you talk about fundamental structure, uh, that's not really where you should base it from my perspective. You should base it on uh, what is the future and what does that look like. Uh, so we have the slide ready that uh, we can put up the mouse down to the PowerPoint. All right, here we go. So let's lay out exactly where Lee County stands today. I, I think this is really important. We are one of the largest political jurisdictions in America. Uh, and the county rank, and this is ranked by the 2022 estimates, but you have the 2020 census adjacent to it, so you can see the population. Uh, what I've done is pulled out not only the states uh, with which we are competitive, uh, but also the counties uh, with which we're competitive in population and competitive in land area. Uh, for example, we're about the same size as San Francisco County, but San Francisco County is... Particularly for those of us that have grown up here uh, and for whom... Uh, though we may say, oh, we get that there's 800,000 people here, it still feels like the 200,000 when I was a kid. Uh, we are not. We are bigger than Oklahoma City. We are bigger than Kansas City, bigger than Nashville, bigger than Tulsa. We are an enormous political constituency. We're bigger than three states, 
actually four states, I apologize, Wyoming, Vermont, Alaska, and North Dakota are all smaller than us. And we're just on the cusp. We'll probably pass South Dakota by 2030. And I think we'll be competitive. I think we will be competitive with a million people. Uh, and if you look at Delaware and Rhode Island, they don't grow. They're basically built out. So if we don't pass them in 2030, I bet we'll pass them shortly thereafter. Uh, and I, I use that uh, as an illustrative kind of eye-opening, uh, if you haven't taken the time to look at it, to talk about how we should structure our local government. Uh, I don't have any other slides beyond this. I'm, I want to talk theory with you. I want to talk organically, and I want to answer the questions you might have. So what do we have today? I will say uh, that I have come to the conclusion we passed our charter in 96. At present, uh, what we have is uh, term limits on the county commission, the, the differences from the standard county arrangement. Term limits on the county commission, uh, limits on uh, the non-interference policy, essentially limits on the legislative branch interaction with the executive branch. Uh, and we have the charter commission. That's it. That is all we have achieved to distinguish ourselves from uh, Glades County. Glades County with 14, 15,000 residents uses the basic county model. They don't have a charter. Uh, we do not have anything different. And so, uh, as I said, I want to talk about all these options, but I will tell you I've reached the conclusion if uh, in this cycle we don't propose any significant alteration to the structure of our government, we should propose to dissolve the charter. I think it's a waste of citizens' time now uh, to have uh, come together. We did four-year terms, 96, 2000, 04, 08, and now we've had two subsequent cycles uh, without really any change whatsoever from the basic county model that's provided for in statute. So what exactly are we getting together for if we don't take up and propose some alteration uh, to that form? Now, what should that form look like? Well, let me talk about what I believe are some infirmities to the current form. And I think especially uh, the non-interference uh, structure needs to be addressed. I think the way that it is written and the way that it operates uh, takes the absolute worst feature of the Articles of Confederation and somehow makes it even worse than that. You have uh, the setup where the executive is appointed by the legislative branch, uh, so there's no independent political accountability of the people, uh, and we'll get into that and the merits and the demerits in both directions of that argument. But below that level, the commission is restricted from having any direct interaction with anyone other than the county manager, the county attorney, and their personal assistant. Now, I want you to imagine a corollary. I served in the legislature for eight years. I could not imagine a scenario where I would have to go ask the governor to borrow his budget staff in order to build the budget and pass it through the legislative branch. I could not imagine a scenario where uh, the leadership of our uh, legislative branch uh, could not have uh, functional, reliable, uh, personal intelligence, personal advice provided to them by their direct employees, but instead would have to depend on the executive branch. Now, again, I prefaced all this, but there's no sacred cows. I'm not talking about any personalities today. I'm talking about in the context of what we know about legislative and executive branch interactions, I think it's a serious infirmity and a serious restriction on the legislative, the county legislative branch's ability to develop their own independent conclusions. And it goes back to my premise where I said if we're not going to make any changes, then we should get rid of the charter, because this is one of the only features of the charter. It restricts the commission, the legislature at the county level, from having any interaction, direct interaction, any command interaction with staff other than uh, the chief executive and the county attorney. Uh, you could also opine, I don't know that, that anyone's really explored this, but I think it's unique that the county attorney serves both branches. Uh, again, as I think back to my experience as a legislature, I, we had our own general counsel for the legislature. We developed our own opinion about the impact of the law, both as it existed and as was proposed, distinct from the legal advice that was provided to the executive branch. I think that level of independence uh, has a great deal to advise it. Uh, and as you think about, again, in the context of a community 
that is headed towards a million people puts us at a level larger than four states, the necessity to have a fully functional uh, set of independent branches becomes even more critical. And that's really what, what I'm, I'm focusing on here. I think we need to decide which way we want to have it. Uh, if we are going to stick with a charter and have distinct executive and legislative branches with non-interference policies, then we need to empower the legislative branch at the county level to gain their own advice on policy and budget and legal positions. And they are prohibited from doing that under the current charter. Uh, either that or we get rid of it, get rid of the charter altogether, in which case that would disappear and you would go to the, the shared executive legislative role at the commission level that is in the fundamental county structure. Um, so let's talk about uh, beyond that. Uh, obviously, I am an elected executive officer. I'm a fan of elected executive office, independent of uh, the legislative branch, and I think it provides a level of accountability uh, for all the reasons that you uh, saw in the debates regarding uh, uh, surrounding the founding of this country when uh, the president was originally chosen by the Congress, and that just doesn't function well. It doesn't allow for uh, the executive branch to have the freedom to do what it needs to do without fear of continual political reprisal. I get elected for a term of four years. Absent committing a felony, I get to run the department, the agency, the way that I believe it should be run. Uh, I certainly work with uh, the Board of County Commissioners. They are my legislative counterpart. They provide the budget for our office. Uh, but I have the discretion to do what I believe is in the best interest of the taxpayers for that term. Uh, that does not exist in our current paradigm. At any meeting, three members of the Board of County Commissioners could fire the chief executive of the county. And I think that hamstrings the executive branch. I think it ultimately uh, leaves them at a disadvantage from being able to operate uh, with a level of political accountability that we certainly expect in uh, the similarly sized political constituencies in the states and most of the counties that I have listed here, they have independent executive authority. Certainly in the states they do. And again, a lot of the largest counties in America have an independent executive authority. Now, that takes multiple forms. Um, the thing to remember is you have, uh, subject to your legal counsel's interpretation of the law, uh, you have an incredible amount of discretion. You don't have to do what's even in the models. As long as the uh, statutes in the Constitution don't say that you can't do it, you can create whatever system you want, or at least propose whatever system you want to the voters if they'll adopt it. There are two models that are provided, three models, excuse me, that are provided uh, in the statutes uh, for consideration to alternates to what we currently have. We currently have the county manager. There is the pure county executive. In Florida, you have that in Duval and Dade counties. Uh, you have a countywide mayor independently uh, elected uh, who operates uh, the same as the constitutional officers do at their level. Uh, I believe Orange County is the only one that has, of the big counties, that has the alternative method where <clears throat> the chief administrator uh, is an appointee of the sole countywide elected board member. Uh, so uh, they've kind of blended uh, an option there where you have single member districts for everyone except for the single countywide mayor, uh, and that mayor functions at the legislative level much like the vice president does in the Senate. They only administer the, the meetings and vote solely in the case of a tie. Uh, otherwise, they are not directly involved in the legislative proceedings, but they do have the direct uh, oversight of the county administrator. Uh, and I do not recall whether they have a requirement that the administrator be uh, confirmed by the balance of the board uh, or whether I think they do. I think the, the administrator has the direct, the county mayor has the direct authority to appoint and then the board uh, confirms that appointment. Uh, but again, in that scenario, you do have some level of direct political accountability for the executive branch. It's unique and different. It's, um, uh, it, it's, it's really, uh, to me, a two-part question. The first part is, uh, do we believe that we should have a distinct executive branch? Well, we already do in our charter. Do we believe that that distinct executive branch should be directly accountable to the people 
politically the same way as our five constitutional officers are, yes or no. And then uh, if you get through yes to that question, how do you structure that, whether that's a, a pure independent executive, whether it's the administrator uh, appointee model, or some other solution that you come up with, uh, either on your own or through research of 3,000 American counties, different experiences, uh, and the pluses and minuses. So uh, corollary to that, and uh, there's no secret that I'm a believer in uh, single-member districts. If we turn to the legislative branch, uh, I think it provides for greater political accountability. Uh, I think it provides the average citizen uh, a greater opportunity to get elected. At this size, running countywide is bigger than running for Congress at this point. We all know Congress is minimum a million dollar race. I don't think it should cost potentially a million dollars to get elected to the commission. Doesn't mean they all have, uh, but it does mean that it's an extraordinary hurdle. And this is a very big and diverse county. Uh, I would challenge anyone to get up at dawn, drive from Alva all the way to Benita, all the way out to Boca Grande, and all the way back here to downtown Fort Myers in a single day, in a day where you can actually interact with anyone. I think just to drive to all those places, you'd have to be full out and not talk to a soul the whole time. It is a huge county with a huge population, and it's very diverse. And again, this is not an indictment of current personalities. I'm talking about when you think about a constituency this large, what is the way we should structure this? Obviously, the legislature at the state level is elected on a single-member basis. Uh, I think that the size I ran originally in a district with 156,000 people, it was possible for me to get elected simply by knocking on doors and talking to the voters. I did not have to raise, frankly, in my first House campaign, I raised $18,000 in the primary, got outspent 10 to 1. So I present myself as prima facie evidence that you don't have to uh, engage in monetary fundraising in order to make a difference if the district is sized appropriately to the constituency uh, and the needs of the constituency. I have previously, uh, both in, in this level and subsequent to that, uh, advocated that I'm totally supportive of a compromise position where you have a blended commission representing both single-member districts and countywide districts so that you get uh, the best of both perspectives because there are regional issues, issues that are bigger than any one district. Uh, you don't want to be uh, held victim to that at the state level. That's why we have two different branches in our legislature that represents drastically different sized constituencies in order to try to achieve those two different perspectives. And I think you can get that by having a blended commission at the local level. I would not think it'd be worthwhile to have two separate legislative bodies. So don't, don't misquote me here today. I'm not advocating for that. Um, and then I'll, I'll finish with this, and then I'll be glad to answer questions uh, about what I've talked about or anything else. Uh, when I served on this and subsequent to uh, the 2006 uh, Charter Review, uh, these were interesting esoteric political questions. Since then, they have been answered by the voters. They have been asked, do you want a 5-2 school board? And they said yes overwhelmingly. They have been asked, do you want an elected executive to run your school board? And they have said yes overwhelmingly. I think if this Charter Review sends some form of those two questions to the voters, you will see that the voters will overwhelmingly, I suspect by more than two-thirds, approve those measures. So I don't think this is a question of political support uh, being in opposition to it. I think the time is past ripe uh, for these questions to be considered and put out uh, for the voters to give their opinion on one way or the other. And with that, Mr. Chair. Anybody have any questions? Nobody? I'll ask you. No. I, I don't think that uh, uh, single member districts is the answer for Lee County. And the reason I think that is because, first of all, I don't want to give up 80% of my vote. When I call a, a county commissioner, I, I don't care what district they're in, I, w I would like a response for it. And right now, a county commissioner has to run countywide. And so, therefore, they have to answer all the constituents' concerns countywide. What we've seen in the past is when we go to single-member districts, we have people building up uh, county staff and 
other programs of infrastructure within the district would other districts suffer because they may not have the, the longevity of the commissioner. And also, uh, it makes it the argument that uh, it's easier for a, a, a county commissioner to get elected if he runs from a single member district. Well, to me, that's, it, that's just not true because uh, uh, right now, uh, if you were able to throw, uh, they're spending between four hundred and fifty and six hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a county commission race now in Lee County. And here, if you recall, just maybe ten years ago, uh, you could run for county commissioner for less than fifty thousand dollars. So what has happened to cause this? What's happened is there used to be growth management statewide, and then uh, when Governor Scott got into office. He did away with the Growth Management Act to where now all 67 counties stand alone. So if developers want to develop in a particular county, they can come in and make massive contributions to a county commissioners and they can get projects done. Whereas before, those projects had to be reviewed if they were over a certain size. Uh, they were called a development of regional impact. And so therefore, if we do something in Lee County that's going to impact Charlotte County or it's going to impact Collier County, we had to have taken into consideration the impact on their infrastructure and their roads. So to me, it was a better planning tool to look at the regional impact of development rather than the local impact of development. And we have an example of that right now out here at Babcock Ranch, where the tax base and everything is in Charlotte County, but all of the impacts are going to be here in Lee County, where there were deals made by previous boards of county commissioners to uh, uh, eight-lane uh, Bayshore Road, uh, uh, six-lane uh, uh, I-75, Highway 31, so all of these things are going to cost us here locally, whereas the impact, all of the tax revenue is going to be going to Charlotte County. So these are things that, that happen when you go to single member districts. And so therefore, I think uh, uh, we're all better off uh, having the current setup to where we get to select all of the county commissioners, not just one. Mr. Chair, thank you. Well, uh, Noel, I will uh, let Charlotte and Collier know they're ready. You, you would like them to merge so we can have a single county with one regional vision uh, for the future. Um, uh, and uh, look, the Growth Management Act, uh, I, will, I was there uh, at the legislature. I don't want to get too deep into that, but I will remind everybody that uh, by the point we brought that up, 95% of county proposals were approved without comment. Uh, so the DCA had become basically nothing more than a rubber stamp for, for uh, the process. But um, on the question of single member, well, the infirmities particularly you're talking about occurred in an at-large county uh, at a time when this was, uh, the election was conducted that way. I do think what more than the change in development restrictions, uh, what has occurred is we have crossed threshold, the horizon, to significant growth. Uh, those of us who have grown up here, this was a single political constituency for a long time, well into the late uh, 20, the early 2000s, the late part of that decade, the county-wide level was a single constituency. Since that time, Cape Coral is booming towards uh, its build out of 300,000 people. Lehigh, I'll give you an example, Lehigh in 2000 was 30,000 people. It's 160 to 180,000 people now, and it's booming towards its 300,000. Uh, so regardless uh, of anywhere else, uh, the two cities that were laid out in 1955 uh, were going to get built out and push us towards a million people with three distinct political constituencies regardless. Um, but to, to, uh, to your point, it, it is uh, the balancing between the different perspectives or why I ended up being a stronger advocate for a blended commission uh, with both single and at-large seats in order to uh, both guarantee that uh, everyone still had the ability 
to vote for a significant portion of the board uh, and also to guarantee that both perspectives were brought uh, to the table. And, you know, it's, it, it is wide open uh, for this charter review to talk about this. You, you look at Dade County, I think, has 21 members. Broward, uh, this is, I'm really off the top of my head, 17 uh, members. The Duval County uh, Commission Council uh, is something like 12 to 15. Uh, so everybody's got a different solution uh, to their political, per, their particular political situation. Um, and, and my uh, basic thesis, I think, still w will hold, regardless of where, where you end up on my downstream suggestions, if the ultimate conclusion of the majority of this commission is that we, once again, don't want to make any changes, then the change you should re uh, recommend is to dissolve the charter because it's not doing anything for us after almost 20 years. Thank you. Any other questions? Just a comment, I guess. Um, the uh, single member district, the problem is like I live in Alpha, so my district is small, or considered uh, population-wise. So my commissioner would be not have the same power that commissioners that live in these big districts do. So I would rather these guys be responsible to me as well as the people in their district because I don't want to have, you know, a four to one vote all the time like we had before. So I think, you know, having a commissioner who's responsible for the guys in Sanibel and Bonita and Cape Coral, um, you know, I think is the, is the right idea. Being a blended, you know, commission now, we have 12 members instead of five, you know, something like that, you know, whatever. And we just mentioned when you first got up there how well everything seemed to be working together. And, and you know, they, they had differences. We've seen it here recently, some differences on the board when some votes and stuff, and I think that's good. I think you need that. Um, but at the same time, we all have to be on the same page and, and do what's right for Lee County as well. And, and I just think because being on the Park and Rec Board when I was, I would see how much money, you know, Lehigh's getting because the impact fees and how much, you know, Estero's getting, Northmire's getting, and, and I can't get shade structures because we don't have the impact fees, you know? So I think districts need to be represented by the whole. And that's just my opinion. Now, so one more. Um, when you're talking about the, you know, getting rid of the charter possibly, if, if that was something we decided to do, I don't understand how, you know, the elected departments like yours and property, um, you know, taxes and uh, other things, how they would operate with one person or a group like the five being the umbrella that, that administered all the... Oh, okay, yeah, no. If that's uh, what you're... No, I'll, I'll be glad I, to expound. I hope not, because, you know, that would be right now, Commissioner can't even go to a department head, really, under the charter, and talk to them. They have to go through the county manager and through the county attorneys, which I think is kind of silly. But I definitely wouldn't want them coming into your department and saying, okay, you know, here's your, I'm like, we need to talk about this, we need to change, you know. And so I hope that's not what you're kind of thinking. And I don't know what, you know, administrator you would think we'd need to have that would cover that umbrella. Chairman? So uh, two points. On single member districts, just for clarity's sake, uh, you, uh, under both case law and I think, uh, constitutional provisions, your single member districts can't be different populations. So uh, even though District 5 represents a very rural area, geographically it would be larger than a lot of the other districts, but the populations would have to be the same. Okay. Um, that's, that's a requirement, uh, a fundamental one. Um, so just, just some predicates, uh, you know, I, this, I'm glad we did the question and answer this way because I don't want to presume what people do or don't know. Uh, the constitutional officers, the five, myself, the tax collector, clerk, uh, supervisor, and sheriff, uh, we're provided for in the state constitution. We, uh, with an amendment passed uh, a few years ago, uh, are uh, exempt from any effect of a local charter. So we, you can't change the, the structure of our office. And in fact, the legislature passed some much more uh, uh, clear and determinative language in this session, uh, primarily based on Miami-Dade's. Miami-Dade is really struggling politically about the bringing back the sheriff. They had dissolved the sheriff uh, in their charter in the 60s, <clears throat> and they are being forced to by that new constitutional provision to bring their sheriff back, uh, and they're fighting over exactly what you're talking about. Uh, but no, I, I find that almost exclusively around the state, 
uh, almost completely around the state. Uh, the constitutional offices uh, work very well and collegially with their boards. Uh, we don't have any interactions, and 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 I'm not advocating that uh, an elected executive would have any oversight of, of our offices. It would be essentially a sixth executive officer elected on the ballot uh, to run from a political uh, accountability standpoint the balance of county operations. So everything that's not covered by our five offices. Yeah. Noel, go ahead again. Uh, I was hoping maybe you could shed some light on the, we, we heard a lot of, about how we needed to add two more school board members so we could have greater diversity and we'd have an opportunity for a more diverse school board. And so we, the voters went along with that and agreed to elect a seven member board. And now the legislature has decided that uh, we should put on the ballot that uh, our superintendent should be elected. And so we're gonna be having an elected superintendent. Now, now how is that gonna work? We, we have our school board sitting over here, which we're paying millions, the extra million and a half or $2 million for these two extra school board members. And all of a sudden, that seven school board members isn't enough. Now we, we, we have to have an elected superintendent. So, so how, how's this gonna work? Sure. Well, I don't know that's several million more dollars for, for two more members. Their well, salaries, the salaries on the order of 35 grand apiece, I think. Um, but I, I think it works exactly uh, as it does in these other political constituencies, particularly the states where you have an elected executive branch and elected legislative branch. I mean, the, the, that's really the fundamental question. I mean, do you or do you not agree with the founders' wisdom on having separation of powers, uh, which uh, is designed to create friction. Uh, you want friction to occur between the branches. The friction is the secret sauce to ultimately the better outcome for the public. That's at least the theory of the separation of powers. And so uh, we are unique. Uh, we're the only county I know of that has gone back to an elected superintendent. And we will see, yes, as you point out, how that election turns out, because that office will be elected here uh, in the next cycle. Uh, but I think it only reiterates my point that on these two questions, uh, the voters have presented, been presented both of them and have overwhelmingly supported them. So, uh, I mean, obviously, neither of these are questions that are of such importance that they are going to go picket in the streets. Um, they, there are other things that rank above these questions for the average person. Frankly, for all of us in this room, we have, uh, you know, we got food to put on the table and kids to raise. And the, the theory of the structure of governance uh, is not first among them. But when presented with the question, two-thirds of the county has come out and said that that's the way they want uh, their school board to be structured. And I suspect that even more so you would see that reaction uh, for this. Uh, what I also want to throw out there, uh, in addition to these topics, I want to remind the, the, the commission, you all have an extraordinary grant of authority. You can explore everything. Uh, for example, there are additional pertinent issues that get talked about every single day that are much more uh, contentious and cause consternation. The balance between municipal and county government, uh, what's incorporated, what's not incorporated, the structure of the water and sewer provision in this county, the structure and provision of fire and police service in this county. Now, I. I've got personal opinions. I'm glad to dive into why I have personal opinions. But what I would point out to you is that uh, these will get addressed eventually. You get to this size and you look at the history in all of these counties and the counties that are larger than us in Florida. Uh, once you cross that, uh, that horizon and you move from a single political constituency with a single orbit to what we have now, which is multiple political constituencies in a county headed towards a million people, a lot of the fundamental services get regionalized because the distinctions no longer exist. Fire, people have heard me talk about this repeatedly. In an, in an era when in the 1970s most of this county was rural, 17 fire districts made sense because these were very unique and distinct political constituencies. There is almost zero uh, physical distinction between most of these districts at this point. Uh, you could maybe make an argument for the most rural of them, but for the vast majority, at least 12 to 13 of them. Uh, they are a single functional community from an administrative standpoint. 
these are questions I think this charter review could tackle. We never have, that I recall in the past, uh, because we seem to perpetually uh, scuttle on the rocks over the two big questions I brought up today, uh, which brings me back to my original thesis. If we scuttle once again, uh, then I really think in fairness to the voters, we should propose dissolving the charter because we're not doing anything with it at this point after almost 20 years. Anybody else have any questions? I have one, Matt. Yeah. Go ahead, Andrew. I was going to say, going back to the um, direct election of, of the chief executive, you mentioned um, that uh, Orange County um, has uh, somewhat of a hybrid model. You've talked about the hybrid model uh, for single member districts. What's the thoughts on the, the hybrid model that Orange County is using um, for that chief executive, or do you think uh, a more direct election like we have uh, in Tallahassee uh, is more appropriate there? Well, I, I approach the elected executive from two fundamental points, and the first is the separation of powers and the wisdom of that that's baked into our Constitution. The, I mean, the, the founders saw how infirm uh, the, the structure was under the Articles, and specifically George Washington created a conspiracy to dissolve the Articles and create the Constitution because of how dysfunctional uh, the legislative interference with the executive branch was uh, at that time. And a model of an independent executive branch uh, has then been adopted by every state in the Union as a result and is actually, I think, if a survey of the largest, biggest counties, municipalities in the country will show independent executive authority is the norm. Uh, we are the uh, aberration from the norm to be this large and to not have any fundamentally different structure uh, on that case. Uh, now, as to how that's achieved, uh, I really speak to the second point, and, and that was the, the thing I focused on a moment ago. Uh, the, the beauty for me or any elected executive officer, from my perspective, is the ability to function for that period of time, that four years, to carry out a vision without any fear of reprisal uh, or political interference um, when uh, you are subject to the voters' uh, decision. Uh, the current structure uh, leaves the county executive uh, in a constant tension. Uh, whether, whether we have uh, the period like we do now, which is relatively good working, but we have all been here, I look around this table, every single one of us have been here in periods when that has not existed, and it's been very, very difficult and very frustrating uh, for the constituents. I think the better model is the one in which uh, the, the head of the executive branch is politically accountable and able to act uh, independently. And, and probably the biggest thing, I, I also hear, nobody's mentioned it here today, but I hear pushback that it's, you know, oh, we'll elect somebody and that will mean the county won't be well run. I, I really would caution against using that because that, that ultimately becomes an indictment of the five of our offices. And I would like to think our five uh, constitutional offices are pretty well run. And uh, as, as a realistic uh, operation, uh, each of us is elected uh, at the top. We set the policy. We set the vision. We are accountable to the voters. Uh, we have chief executive officers that answer directly to each one of us and are professionals, the kind of professionals that people talk about uh, that go and pursue uh, accreditation and degrees and training in the nuances of local uh, county government and the ins and outs of that. Uh, I think that is exactly the kind of model you would end up with. I think essentially, uh, if you were to go for an example, uh, really under any model, you would end up with a county manager, the kind of county manager that we have right now, a position that exists and oversees the county executive branch, and that person would be accountable to uh, a political uh, elected office, uh, someone who would designate uh, who that is and would be carrying out the vision that uh, the people have for the executive branch. To, so you take all of that. What should the structure be? Uh, I'm also a political pragmatist. Uh, the structure should be whatever one can get at least 12 votes. Uh, well, nine votes, I think it is, at least to bring to the commission, but really 12 votes uh, around this table. Uh, that's the one I would be most in favor of. Any other questions? So, Matt, you're our Lee County appraiser. Um, but you're standing up there tonight, uh, and are you serving in that role speaking? Are you serving as a private citizen? Are you serving as 
No, that's a your other, your other position, which is a political consultant, or what? No, that's a great question, Nathan. And the truth is, uh, I could say whatever I want, but there's no way to escape the reality. Uh, I serve in all of those positions. I think the thing you should take uh, from this is how seriously I believe in these fundamental questions. Uh, most people would say uh, conventional political wisdom, uh, there's nothing that benefits me from showing up here and having this conversation at all. Not a single thing I've said tonight is necessarily going to make me more popular uh, if my goal was to be popular as a result of interacting with this board. Uh, my goal is to serve or to share with you uh, what I believe to be the case. And I believe these things are the true uh, realistic considerations we have to make as a county, whether I'm wearing my hat as your elected property appraiser, and obviously I bring my experience now, uh, coming up on three years serving in that executive role, uh, whether that's as having been a former legislator representing this community, whether that's as uh, the, uh, the state committee man for the local Republican Party, whether that's as a private citizen uh, in my capacity, both uh, as a political advisor and a, a property appraiser, uh, someone who's lived in this county since 1981 uh, and has seen it uh, in both uh, good and bad times. Uh, listen, we, we still hold the distinction, as far as I know, of having the only county commission that lacked a quorum the day after the arrests. Uh, when in the 1980s, three of the five were all arrested at the same time. So we have, uh, and by the way, Palm Beach tied us. They, have, they had three, but they have a seven-member board, so they could still have a meeting the next day uh, after it. Uh, so listen, we, we, are, uh, we, are, uh, we have a notorious history, frankly, um, and I think that history is a lot of the reason why this charter was proposed originally. Uh, but the questions we're talking about right now, the questions that I think you're going to end up debating are the same questions they debated in 1996. And the political compromise they came to at that point is let's just get a charter so that we can have this conversation and then we'll visit each of these individual topics. Mm -hmm. And here we are 20 years later having not resolved that whatsoever, uh, but having, uh, I, think, uh, I, I think, gained less for it in the non-interference and uh, lack of legislative staff uh, to function as an independent branch. Uh, even though they're listed as separate, they don't really have the staffing or the ability to function as a separate legislative branch. Anybody else? Questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Anybody from our audience, anybody want to speak? <laughs> Good afternoon. Sorry, I had to make the public comment earlier. I was going to speak. Um, as you know, I was driving from South Lee County. And uh, thank you for probably your appraiser, um, Matt Cole, for pointing that out. So people that know me well, uh, my name is Cecil Pendergrass, and I started my day off this morning at 8 o'clock. So this gentleman here to my left here, uh, Ray Sandelli, uh, we were the Port Authority this morning with the um, ribbon cutting. And after that, as Matt Caldwell said, this is a very large county and I saw all of it today. And I'll be going to Lehigh Acres after this meeting. So thank you for pointing out. And uh, anybody who wants to follow me around every day, be happy to join me. Um, so again, I, was really, I came here to talk about something else real quick. And thank you for serving on the Charter Review Commission. It's really important you're here. And I know you want to make some changes, and that's a great thing. I want to make changes that are going to impact everybody in Lee County, not just a certain few. I'm not trying to get a job for my colleagues. I'm not trying to create another election office. I'm a Republican, so I like small government. But what I am here to talk about, there is something we could do from the county government where I'm going to put, in the future, I'm going to ask you to, to invite me back here to speak to the group with a presentation. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have in Lee County is growth. Like Matt said, growth is something that's changed here the last, I've been here all my life for 59 years now. And... So what's happening is we have the cities growing, and we see what's happening, how it impacts the counties, how it impacts Pine Island, how it impacts North Fort Myers, Alva. We see the growth throughout the county. Um, the, the challenge that the county is having is services, everything from utilities. The school district's seen it with the impact of the children in the schools. We see it with water quality. We see it with wetlands being destroyed. We see it with habitat loss. But what I'm looking at doing is something where we could do um, in the future to help us, the county, 
we can put in the charter to restrict some of that growth when the cities are ad volunteering annexing areas from the county, which is green space now, into the cities. And it's happening everywhere. It's happening on Pine Island. I know the people live in Mount Lache. They live there for a reason. They don't want to be part of Cape Coral. And I get that. They move there for a reason. They live in Alva because they don't want to be part of the city of Fort Myers, for example. Or they don't want to be part of Charlotte County with Babcock coming down. So what's happening in Lee County, the city of Fort Myers is encroaching south down in the Daniels Parkway and taking green space, um, all from bonus density to areas, increasing traffic, increasing services in those areas. And we really have no say in that from the county perspective. But what we're looking at doing is, I'm looking at doing is bringing forward a presentation in the future where you can change the charter, you can make actually change that impacts everybody in the county here, and it impacts everybody, not just a few people or special interest groups. But what it would do is help us have a voice at the table. So if the city of Cape Coral, for example, was trying to annex the property in Matt Lache, the county commission would have a say on that. We could actually have a vote on that before they annex that property and come in and develop it and all for bonus disease. For example, the one parcel we're doing now in the city of Fort Myers, hopefully they do the right thing next week. It was Trayport Commerce and it was industrial, the corner of Treeline Daniels. They offer bonus density to the owners and well, now your property's worth $40 million now, so $4 million. And they want to go in and build a lot of apartments and they'll turn around and flip it the next day and it'll be run by some hedge fund. Meanwhile, people in the area in the city of Fort Myers doesn't have water. They don't have water utilities. And it's really, it's, it's really alarming. Uh, it's one of the things that's going to impact the county for the future. So I'll be happy to bring this back in the future. So you actually can talk about something this year as a Charter Review Commission to add that to our charter to impose like a district in the county. We can take areas and make a district out of it. And the county commission can come back later and say yay or nay on that. Because right, right now we have no say on that. So thank you for your time. Thank you for serving again and volunteering your services. Please will be sure to leave. Anybody have any questions? Yes. I'd be happy to take any questions if, I, if I'm allowed to. Ready? Andrew? I'm sure you'll come back on a presentation and talk about this in more detail, but like the portions of Matt Lache or some of those others where we actually have residents in those areas, were you thinking that the vote goes to you as the county commissioners or would it go to a referendum to the residents? It would come back to the county commission. If the land use changed, for example, if um, Richard's here, he can probably help us there, and Andrew can help too. For example, if a property owner decides to annex a property that contingents to the city of Cape Coral to Cape Coral, then as they go through that land, the annexation, the Board of County Commission will have, a, have to approve the annexation before they could do that. Am I correct, Andrea? I mean, yeah. from what we talked about briefly, okay. Anybody else have any questions? I, mean, I think that's very important, because I know what you're talking about on, one on Daniels, and the only way really to hedge that is saying, okay, you can't have an entrance right. in Daniels Road. You know, and so you're kind of hamstrung because they can come in and take the property and increase density and do whatever they want to. Right. And if they do get around somehow the, the DOT by having an entrance on Daniels Road. Right. And kind of, kind of like Keith, you kind of brought up earlier, reference Matt's comments about being one ward and different wards and everything. I grew up and worked in the city for March for 30 years. And I saw the single member district wards work. I saw Veronica and Ann Knight and Dunbar get nothing with the years and years of you know, everything went to McGregor and different areas of the city. We had single member districts to get that vote. And so I understand how that works as far as that. But what happens here is right now we don't have a say at all with the cities because they, if the owner voluntarily anxious in, it impacts us. So what's happened with the, for example, the city of Fort through the year, last 10 years, a lot of growth in Ward 6, they've grown, they gave away all the impact fees, all the development back to the developers to a certain point. And they didn't provide the infrastructure for the utilities throughout the years. And now there's a lot of projects going on in the area they don't have utilities for. So it's unfortunate. We want the utilities in place, but they don't have the funding for that now because they grew too fast and they didn't prepare for that. And they want to, they want then to put that off on the county, which you, the taxpayers or users, if you live in the city of Florence here, you'll be paying higher fees because of that. And that's why, I, the, really, it's just piece by piece. We want to make sure we protect, you know, and it was alluded to earlier about Orlando. I don't want to look like Orlando. So how you don't look like Orlando is you don't govern like Orlando. Um, but this, this proposal I'm talking about came from originally Orange County. They take districts and make it basically historical districts. But we can do further preservation districts and say that this area is preserved. Pine Island, Metal Shade, wetlands, okay? We had a zoning case two months ago. We denied it with cause with confidential evidence because it's wetlands and it's mangroves. So we didn't develop it. So there's ways to do that to make sure we preserve what we have now. No, go ahead. Uh, I'm really glad to see you for bringing this issue forward because I think it's a really timely. I think it's something we really do need to address. 
we kind of had the reverse situation happen out on Pine Island where we took a lot of our uh, user fees and we spent $5 million on building a pumping station uh, off the island to serve all of these tracks that were not serviceable by the utilities in Cape Coral. And they were happy for us to do it because they didn't have the money to do it. So we spend you know, all this money on infrastructure. We serve all of these out parcels along Pine Island Road that are all now being annexed. And as a matter of fact, this, the legislature is looking to uh, uh, propose a bill that allows them a special exception to annex these parcels and without any say from the county and without any say like uh, uh, Fort Myers is doing over there at uh, Tree Line and uh, Daniels uh, where the, uh, they have no water for the, that project but yet they're moving forward to approve it and the same thing is happening in Cape Coral where we're losing millions of dollars out on Pine Island because of this of not having any policy that addresses the uh, incorporation annexation of these areas that are now county jurisdiction. Right. And your group is perfectly made up to talk about this. You have land use attorneys, you have people in engineering, development, people from the community that's seen. So this, this, this board, this commission here is a great place to start this conversation to see if this is something we could do, what we want to do in Lee County to help our community overall. And like I said, this is something that would help everybody. I'm not trying to make history or change history. I'm trying to do the right thing for our community. And I think this would give us an, a tool from the commission side to when these items come up, we would have a say. Because right now, when somebody calls and complains to me about an annexation or development, I have no control over it. And it's really unfortunate. But a lot of times it's good projects. But we want to make sure they do it right and make sure there's infrastructure in place, transportation, utilities, health care, and also not damaging our green space and mangroves, for example. Will the uh, county attorney's office provide us some kind of framework to look at? Yes, we already started that discussion. I'll be continuing working with them and be happy to come back in any of your future meetings and present that to you. If something you can just kick around to see if there's something you all want to look at, this is from me as Cecil Pendergrass, not as the, from the Board of County Commissioners, um, to see if you, want to, if you want to make some changes. This is something that would help the whole community. It's like I said, I'm not trying to change anything to help one person or a group or anything. I'm just doing it to help the county overall. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, members, commission members, have any items for discussion they'd like to bring up or discuss? <laughs> we did have some guests tonight, so thanks for coming. I'm going to, Ron. Well, I do have one thing. Andrea reminded me of something when she looked over here that I said I might ask us. I know that our charge is to bring forth things that we've heard either from other community members that we run into or things that we think about and just get the idea on the table on things that, that we might be acquainted with that folks have raised. Has anyone received any input from, from anyone that says, hey, this is something you guys really ought to look at and maybe get that on the table to, you know, I'm taking some notes here on things that are checklists of things we, we may want to look at at some point. Does anyone have anything else that, that they might well, I've heard about. I have one that I've heard quite a bit of conversation about countywide, and that is uh, right now, the, uh, a number of years ago, the county commissioners adopted a, uh, an ordinance that, uh, uh, in terms of public comment on any types of uh, rezoning or development proposal, to where uh, currently you have to uh, go before, you have to appear at the hearing examiner's office in order to go to the county commissioners when the county commissioners hold their public hearing on that project, you can't speak unless you spend a whole day of your time because when you go to a hearing examiner meeting, you don't get to speak until the developer and all of their consultants speak first. Uh, I've personally sit there before for three days waiting to speak so that I would have the opportunity to address the board of county commissioners. This is something that people are very upset about countywide and they'd like to see it changed as something that we could put direct ballot and the voters could vote whether they want to see a change there or not. And then, uh, uh, so that's, that's one of the big issues I think out there. And then uh, another issue is that a number of years ago, 
we have development orders that are sitting on the books in this county from the 1980s. We have a bunch of them out on Pine Island. And so what happens is they were approved during the 1980s with the uh, rules and regulations that were in place at that time. So what happens is they keep getting renewed until here today the market is right to where they could actually develop that project that they designed back in 1980. So now the roads are all impacted, the roads are all crowded, we don't have the infrastructure to handle the, the sewer, uh, we should not be putting more septic tanks out on the barrier island if we're concerned about water quality. That's the worst place in the world we should be putting it. But yet we have 10,000 septic tanks out there and we continue to uh, approve more development out there on Pine Island without adequate sewer. Uh, there is a sewer plant out there, but it wasn't built to serve the people of Pine Island. It was built to serve Mount Lachey because there was a court order to where they had to get the sewer plant off of Little Pine Island. So this is something I've talked to uh, my commissioner about, and he is likewise concerned about it. And uh, But that's something we could ask the voters. Do, do you want to have a sunset on these development orders? Why should they be allowed to go for five years, didn't do anything, and then come back and renew it for another five years, and then here we are 20, 30, 40 years down the road, and all of a sudden we're getting all of this development, and everybody is saying, well, where did this come from? Well, it, it came because we don't sunset old development orders. Great, thank you. Anybody else? So at some point, I'm assuming you're going to bring that up in a motion form. Anybody else? Um, I was going to say that um, a lot of us are on social media, Facebook, et cetera. Um, I'm going to ask that all of us um, post something, if you want, on your Facebook site to let our friends out there know about the Charter Commission and invite him to meetings. This is a thought or an idea. Mr. Chairman, if I could Sir? Add Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and just to update the uh, commission on that issue, um, our community engagement staff has been posting um, social it. media posts about this. This is on the Lee County Government Facebook page, if you want to follow that. Um, and you can share those posts. Um, and They've been creating um, Facebook events for each of our meetings, um, posting live streams of these meetings, um, including the guest speakers. Uh, they're going to be showcasing uh, commission members and some of the Facebook posts. Um, and we also have a county newsletter that is pushing out information about the Charter Review Commission and what we do here and inviting the public to uh, participate at our meetings. So. Thank you. Yep, that's good. You all should have received a notice for the next couple of meetings. You did not? I did not. I did not. Is it even the same? I did. I'll check it out. A couple of weeks ago. All right. We have the date in the next meeting. June 13th. Next meeting is June 13th, 5 o'clock here. We have a motion to adjourn. So moved. We're all done.